All right. I am Flint Dibble, and welcome back to Archaeology with Flint Dibble. I have been asked by many people who I, I can't see you in the crowd, but I know you're there somewhere, to give a breakdown of my time on Joe Rogan talking with Graham Hancock. Uh, I apologize for it taking so long. I was in New Orleans right afterwards for almost a week at the Society for American Archaeology Conference presenting some of my research. It went fantastic. The food was great. Meeting colleagues was great, etc. And so let's think about my time, uh, my five minutes of fame, I guess it is, on the Joe Rogan experience. I sat down and talked with Graham Hancock. Uh, as an archaeologist, I think the first real archaeologist ever to go on Joe Rogan. And so I do want to thank him for the opportunity to, to reach his audience. Um, and the whole goal was to test this lost Ice Age advanced civilization whose influence spanned the globe, who had agriculture, monumental architecture, arts, engineering, and spread it to others. So tune into that episode for all those details. I have been asked many times, how did it go? And I have to say, first of all, I have gotten such great feedback from people. I really appreciate my family, my friends, my colleagues, and then hundreds of other people, maybe thousands, who have gotten in touch to say good job. I really, really appreciate it, and I really appreciate uh, the kind words and the ability and, and opportunity to share what I do and my passion for archaeology with so many people out there, really, seriously. So how did it go is the question I always get. How did it go? Well, let's see. Roll the clip. But can we say there's no evidence for an advanced civilization in what they have studied? In what they have studied, yes, we can say there's no evidence yeah. for an advanced civilization. We heard from Graham Hancock that there is no evidence for his lost Ice Age civilization. This is one of the memes that somebody sent me, and ding, 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 yeah, I feel pretty good. I'm not going to lie. I think that from the kind of responses I've gotten, I feel really good that I, I was able to communicate clearly real archaeology to so many people in an interesting way and to show why we aren't looking for this kind of lost civilization, because we're not. I mean, to be honest, every single time we dig a trench, every single time we open up a new site, we are looking for any civilization, for any group of people, for any artifacts. So every single excavation and survey tests this hypothesis. It is constantly being tested and constantly being shown to have no evidence as we heard from Mr. Hancock. So, okay, I clearly went there very well prepared and I have to thank everybody for uh, chipping in and giving me articles to read, PowerPoint slides. In this case, Matt Bullinger of Southern Methodist University shared an ancient corn cob. So this is a maize cob from about 1250 AD. This is part of the Southern Methodist University Archaeological That's Research Collection. That's how little collection. they were back then. That's how little wild. they were. So if you want to hold it, you can. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Chuck it over here. Be so careful how old it. is this? That's uh, from about 800 years ago. Wow. Yeah. It's, and so, so I want to thank Matthew Bullinger. Was this a Bullinger. full uh, yeah, piece that's of corn? Yeah, that's a full cob, yeah. Folks, this is like a thumb. Not even my thumb. <laughs> it's, like, it's like one of my smaller fingers. And just to this get us crazy. Sense of, oh, clearly I went in as prepared as I could. And there's a whole lot of stuff. I probably only shared 20 to 30% of what I went in with. What I was able to show was, fortunately, just how much evidence we have. We have so much evidence, um, archaeological evidence, all over the globe, underwater, above water, under the earth, above, on the surface. Everywhere you look, there's archaeological evidence, and archaeologists are busy collecting it. We are in the tens of thousands around the world. And so, you know, I was able to show really clearly how there's just so much evidence that really disproves this lost civilization. Graham claims that it's a, a civilization that traveled the seas. Why don't we have any shipwrecks? I mean, we have shipwrecks from every other period of human prehistory and history. And so it's, a, it's amazing that there be none. People say, could it preserve? Of course it would preserve in some locations. We have fossils going back millions of years. We have wood going back hundreds of thousands of years. I should have put that slide here. I'll show you it later. Um, and I just couldn't share everything, though. And I want to say, look, I showed up with a few dozen stone tools. You know, these things, that some of which my dad made like this really cool point right here, and this Clovis point that James Green, a cultural resource management, a commercial archaeologist made for me and shipped to Austin. I wish I had the time to share this. I, I, I promise you in the future I'll do a video on stone tools, how we can tell whether a stone tool is made by humans or not. I think it's really important, and please, if you ever have a stone tool, don't cut yourself. They're very sharp. Seriously, they are. Um, people do eye surgery with obsidian. And, of course, you all heard my dad was an archaeologist. He named me after this kind of stone. 
Flint. My, my brother's name is Chip. My name is Flint. We're named after these artifacts. He was a crazy dude. There's been a lot of comments about him on the internet. I have to say I miss him so much. He died in 2018 of cancer suddenly. He was a great dad, a great archaeologist, a great scholar. I try to model everything I do off of him. And, you know, he was an innovator in terms of developing new technology. For example, the total station right there. Uh, wrong way. I can't point in the right way. Uh, <laughs> I still can't. Uh, he was one of the first people to use that. He designed software, barcoding, and I try to go after that and do my own thing as well. I, I've designed touchscreen databases, speech recognition, large-scale GIS, geographical information systems for projects. We'll talk about this in some future videos of how archaeology uses 21st century technology. Um, and at the same time, you know, I talked about one of the surveys he did in Egypt in the Sahara. Graham saying, archaeologists have not surveyed the Sahara. Man, plentiful surveys of the Sahara have happened and plentiful Stone Age artifacts have been found from this period. Why is it we can find, you know, just the traces of hunter-gatherer encampments and working areas, but we can't find a super advanced lost civilization with monuments and art and agriculture? Come on, man, seriously. And at the same time, we de delved a little bit into... Yoni, can you play this? We delved into some underwater archaeology, and so I want to warn everybody that an interview with Jessica Cook Hale, we saw a little portion of it on Joe Rogan, is coming up. Underwater archaeology of the Stone Age. Hopefully get it out in the next week or two and show you how we do that. How archaeologists like Jessica do that, I should say. I'm not an underwater archaeologist. And at the same time, I showed some coastal archaeology. We actually have a good amount of coastal evidence from the Ice Age, from right near these coasts. There is no boardwalk empire clustered up in that mile or two. What we have is hunter-gatherers engaging with the coasts all over the world, every continent in the world except for Antarctica. We're not going there. Okay, I left out so much. For example, let's talk about Atlantis. This is actually some of my own research. Part of the reason I was excited to do this is my dad was an Ice Age archaeologist. I'm a Greek archaeologist. I read ancient Greek. I've done a lot of research on Atlantis because as an archaeologist online, people have asked me about it. And I just want to pause for a minute. This image is made by my partner, Yonita Martini. She is amazing. She put this together through Photoshop. This is not AI. Let me move over a little bit. There you go. We're going to see a lot more on, about Atlantis on this channel because I'm writing a book on it right now. But it, So when we think about Atlantis, I'll get into the details in a video next month probably. I have a really good video coming out on this on how it's a philosophical allegory. It's not history. It's not mythology. We can think about Plato and Socrates. And we can also sit here and ground truth it. So, for example, you know, in Plato's dialogue, the Timaeus and the Critias, he describes not just Atlantis. He describes Athens. And I dig and work and study material from ancient Athens. I am super familiar with the archaeology of ancient Athens. And guess what? You know, I always say work from the known to the unknown. We need to look at Plato's descriptions of Athens because we can fact check him. Like, for example, he claims that the Acropolis and Lycavitos were connected at one point. We know geologically this cannot be true. He grew up, he lived in Athens, he taught in Athens. He knows the history and archaeology of Athens. Why is he getting things wrong about Athens? If we can't trust his details about Athens, we can't trust them about Atlantis. And then I want to just, this is something I left out, I'd like to get into. Graham Hancock and Magicians of the Gods, he claims that there's these hieroglyphic texts from Edfu, this temple at Edfu, that is an Egyptian telling of the Atlantis story. Okay? And we brought it up, roll the clip, he brought it up at some point, and I said, let's talk about it. And then he didn't. The Temple of Horus at Edfu, where the Atlantis story is told uh, in an ancient Egyptian context, is a good example of that. He said, let's talk about it, but then we never did. And there's a good reason that he did not, because this is one of his weakest arguments. This actually shows one of the biggest problems with Graham Hancock and his scholarship, if you will, how he does research. First of all, the Edfu texts were recorded after Plato. During the Ptolemaic period, 100, 200 years after Plato wrote down Atlantis. Big problem if you're trying to say this is the ancient Egyptian legend that tells about Atlantis, right? Second of all, he claims in the book that he's quoting the Edfu texts, and he tells these stories. We'll look at those quotes in a second. But he's not quoting the Edfu texts directly. He's quoting a summary of them in a book on Egyptian religion written by Yves Raymond in 1969. Big problem. Now... The second big problem, some people claim that Graham Hancock cherry-picks evidence. Let's look at how he does this. And so, what he does in chapter 9 in Magicians of the Gods is he puts together these quotes, 
And if you track down the footnotes, these quotes are real problematic. So he puts one sentence from page 113, dot, 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 then the next sentence from page 109, dot, 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 the next sentence from page 127. Or in the next big block quote where he tells the story of a flood, he puts a sentence from page 173 next to a sentence from page 324 next to a sentence from page 190. Who does this? This is not how you do research. You can't mash together random quotes from completely different pages and claim that this is the story told on these Edfu texts. Watch, I can do this to his books, right? Let's see what I can do with some selective dot, dot, dots, taking sentences out from different page numbers. I could say, this is all Graham Hancock's words. He wrote, Flint had been involved in another project. I was a young archeologist, he explains. I was looking for my own project. Soon afterwards, the American archaeologist made a second unsettling discovery. All was confusion. All was paradox. All was mystery. The extraordinary story of Atlantis, the whole tale of the lost Ice Age civilization, was not and never, under any circumstances, could have been a high civilization at that time because of hard evidence which absolutely rules out the existence of an Atlantis-type civilization in the Upper Paleolithic. These are all Graham Hancock's words. If you take sentences with ellipses, dot, dot, dots, from different pages of different chapters of different books, you can create whatever story you want. And that's the fingerprints of the gods that Graham Hancock often uses. I really wanted to talk about this on Joe Rogan, and it's a shame I didn't have a chance to, because this is what we call cherry picking. On a blog post that Graham Hancock wrote, he describes himself not as a scholar, not as a researcher, but as a lawyer. And he admits he's very selective in his evidence, because he's trying to convince everybody of what he says. And so it's really important to see how he does this, and how this is not scholarship. And so I just, I think I mentioned it before, I do want to make sure that we talk about Atlantis because I have a series of videos coming out on this and a book that I'm working on. So we will get into depth on Atlantis. That's the matrix because of Plato's cave, you know? <laughs> Kudos to Yoni for also making that with Greek letters. Um, my research has focused on a wide variety of topics. I've been an archaeologist and a historian for several decades. My undergrad honors thesis at the University of Pennsylvania was on ancient drugs and archaeology history and myth. So we can expect some videos on that in the near future. And in particular, I wrote my honors thesis on Greco-Roman magic spells, wormwood, opium, nightshade, henbane, all kinds of crazy stuff. It's, it's a lot of fun to read. We'll, we'll read some of that, okay? We'll, we'll do some magic spells. Um, and I also excavate all over the Mediterranean. This is me removing the cover slab from a monumental Roman tomb from Histria in Romania. It's one of my main projects. We'll talk a little bit about that. And I study animals, though, right? And so I want to tell a story. You know, I, I gave this lecture. This is one of my first big public lectures in Athens, Greece. And I was talking about one of my studies on the island of Crete at Azoria. And to get some images for this lecture titled Goats and Other Animals at Azoria, I went to Twitter and I said, hey, who's got really good goat pictures that I can share with people? And so this is Zeus the goat um, shared by my friend Heinrich. And so my friend started replying to this. And I got so many fantastic photos of goats from archaeologists, right? This is here, one in Romania. Um, here we go, one in Italy. I like to think of this goat as a wizard. Thank you, Umberto. Um, and then pretty quickly, this started spreading because there's, everybody has good goat pictures. If you go around all different kinds of countries, goats are everywhere and they're very photogenic. And so shepherds started sharing goat pictures with me. Um, for example, Apple and True Grit um, from, Ca from California here in the U.S., um, or Eves Wiseman, so I had animal behavioral scientists send me some of their fantastic photos. And, you know, look, goats are just so cute. Just look at these little guys. I mean, who does not like a really good goat picture? And so my point is, I might be an archaeologist, okay? But I really have one of the best collections of goat pictures in the world, okay? I, I don't really have a, a point to make on that, other than I like to study ancient goats and their bones and stuff like that. And, and you'll see some of these pictures probably in the future, you know, because they're really cool pictures. Um, this is that site, Azoria on Crete. It's one of the biggest projects I've been working on for the last, I don't know, if, what, at this point, 12 years, something like that. It's a major, major Greek city-state. Uh, if you check out some of my videos, I give some lectures on it. I'll try to introduce you to this excavation because it's totally fascinating. And I have great drone footage and other other cool evidence from the team, if you see what I mean. The site was abandoned suddenly, and so the, the conservators at the Institute for Aegean Prehistory were able to conserve 
hundreds if not thousands of different pots. And so we really have an unprecedented picture of people living on Crete at this time around 500 BC. It's just, you know, it's stunning and it's the kind of thing that's real archaeology that I think we need to be sharing, right? This is what people need to hear about. What do we do in the 21st century? And so, you know, what I do is I study animal bones. I've studied probably a million of them total, different bone fragments, 200,000 of them from Azoria, probably almost 300,000 at this point. And they're really small. They're really tough to identify. This colander has 1,000 of them. It's a lot of work, but, you know, it's very rewarding because I get to tell these stories about animals and people in the past, and it's very valuable. And that's how I was able to start to talk about domestication and uh, topics like that. For example, all these pollen cores come from an article that I was an author on um, where we presented paleoenvironmental evidence from Greece, specifically looking at uh, different examples of climate change over time in the, the peninsula of the Peloponnese. And so connecting that to major historical and archaeological changes in material culture and what people were doing. And guess what? It turns out that climate change does have an impact on society and on people and on the food that they raise and, and all kinds of stuff. It's a topic I'm going to interview Eric Klein uh, in the future about his book after 1177. And so it's something we, I want to talk about because I published a lot on climate change at the end of the Bronze Age. He just finished a, a really popular book on it. And so we'll have a, a really good conversation, I think. Um, and so, you know, that is this kind of stuff that I teach all the time is how do we understand domestication? How do we understand the role of animals and plants in the environment in human cultures in the past? And so, you know, I, I really want to emphasize that I was talking about the difference between wild and domesticated wheat. And it's about that scar that you can see kind of on the bottom here. And the scar is different in wild wheat and domestic wheat because in wild wheat, the, the seeds fall off, they break off immediately. It's an adaptive function that helps them propagate themselves. While in domestic wheat, they hang on because they go with the people harvesting them who then plant it, and then that causes this kind of evolution in these plants. I do want to point out, though, that this is not new evidence. This is nothing that I've discovered. This has been known since like the 1970s and 1980s. Gordon Hillman and others have published it. It's a really well-documented phenomenon that has been backed up at this point by hundreds of thousands of plant remains all over the world, dozens of species. You know, it's the kind of archaeology, environmental archaeology 101, that you could learn in an undergrad classroom. And that's what I want to share with you guys, that there's so much archaeology out there that unless you really took a lot of archaeology courses at university, it's just, it, you're gonna, your mind is going to be blown by all the stuff we can talk about in terms of human culture, how, they, how plants adapt to us, that kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And you know what? Graham Hancock and others think that archaeologists try to censor him. The problem is, whenever we want to talk about this interesting stuff with the media or a documentary, we are the ones who get split out of context. And we're the ones that are censored. We cannot get across what we do in the 21st century. And that was one of the reasons I agreed to do this on Joe Rogan, was I knew that it wouldn't be edited. So I would had the chance to, at length, share real archaeology with everybody. It was just truly a, a phenomenal experience to be able to do that. And because the goal is, I just want to share the real shit. The real shit of the past. And yes, this is the largest ancient piece of shit. A coprolite. A, a fossilized piece of dung. It's, I, I think it's eight centimeters long. And so it's, the, it's from York, from Jorvik. It's called the Lloyd's Bank Coprolite. I'll have an episode on ancient shit because, look, I'm here to give you the real shit. That's what I'm here to do, okay? And so I just want to emphasize one last time just how important it is to understand history and archaeology. Everything we do is based on what we're taught, which is based on history and experience. Every single decision we all make, whether it's politicians, business people, or educators, or yourself in your daily life, I think it's important for people to have access to understanding how archaeologists and historians do their actual research. How do we critically evaluate the past? How do we have uh, the real evidence that we create these narratives from? And I think that that's the kind of information that is really relevant and helpful to everybody out there. So that's what I'm here to do. And so, just to end, I do want to be very clear, we are not looking for an advanced lost ice age civilization. We have so much evidence, millions of sites, billions of artifacts. Like I said in the debate, there's, there's 13,000 Paleolithic sites in the Paleolithic radiocarbon database of Europe alone. 13,000 from the end of the Ice Age. We have so much evidence that nobody knows about. And it's very, the preponderance of evidence is overwhelming. Some people have said the burden of proof was on Graham Hancock. No, 
No, I am not a skeptic. I am an expert. I will always share my proof and my evidence with you. I, when I disprove something, I'll be presenting evidence as to why. The, as an expert, I always accept the burden of proof. I am here to share it. And whether it's Ice Age evidence, whether it's food, whether it's Atlantis. And I just want to say, look, some people think that archaeology just disappears due to time. That's not how things work. Depending on the burial condition, materials can survive for hundreds of thousands. Stones going to survive for millions and billions of years. These stone tools will be available. I know people think that with time, material disappears. That's not true. We have many examples of Ice Age, Stone Age, wooden artifacts, usually in waterlogged conditions, like under the sea or in a lake, a lagoon, etc. And so these date back hundreds of thousands of years. We have fossils going back millions, maybe billions even. How is it that there's an advanced civilization that's global and huge and has monumental stuff and there's nothing? Give me a break. Sorry, just give me a break. There's a, there's a reason we're not looking for it. But again, if I found it, I'd publish it. Every single trench we dig, every single survey we walk, every single time we look at aerial photography or LIDAR or whatever, we are searching and testing the past against all these hypotheses. But the preponderance of evidence suggests there is simply no advanced Ice Age civilization. I'm sorry to break it to you. Some people asked for this uh, clip. This is blown up. Good archaeology on YouTube. There's other channels too. Check out real archaeologists, those who share real archaeology. I cannot convince you enough. The real thing is so much more interesting than the fake thing. Similarly with podcasts, and as I mentioned there, I forgot to bring up Let's Talk About Myths Baby. I'm going to appear on there in the next week, I think, about the end of the Bronze Age and climate change and agriculture and animal husbandry. I also wanted to give a shout out to the Delicious Legacy podcast, which focuses on food. And uh, I've done a couple interviews there. You can check them out. And then the rest of these are all fantastic. Please go check out the Tales from Atlantis. We all heard from Curly um, during the, the debate itself. And lastly, a big thank you to everybody who helped me. This was a huge, huge monumental undertaking. It was, it was my strategy, my research, but I had a lot of help pointing me to articles, videos, images, etc. And in particular, I got to thank Yonita Martini, my wife, who has done so much work behind the scenes. And then my friend and colleague, Dan Falou, who really helped me research a lot into what Graham has said. Matthew Bullinger contributed to the Corn Cob. We saw Jessica Cook Hale and Marika Stoll we saw as well. She had a great video that we saw. And everyone contributed in a big way by, by pointing out different aspects that I should be thinking about, different research articles, etc. So I cannot thank everybody enough. Archaeology is collaborative. We collaborate with each other. We collaborate with other scientists and historians, art historians, pretty much every single field in the world we collaborate with, whether it's astronomy, geology, biology, whether it's literature, languages, and the arts, whether it's digital techniques or economics, archaeology is the ultimate set of collaboration. Every single aspect of human knowledge is useful for understanding the human past. And so lastly, I just want to say real archaeology is hard, dirty, but fun work. There is Yoni and me just absolutely disgustingly dirty after a day of backfill and excavation at Pompeii because you know this is what archaeology really is you know I don't know what else to say <laughs> so uh thank you all uh, for tuning in give me a like and a subscribe if you're really interested I'd love to have some channel members patreon subscribers or buy me a coffee at ko-fi.com slash flint dibble Look, I really would appreciate it. My day job is to do real archaeology, but the more support I get, the more of this I can invest time, energy, maybe buy some better equipment into making some kick-ass YouTube videos. So uh, thank you very much. Rock on real archaeology. And uh, yeah, peace out.